Amen. Matthew chapter 25, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at the parable of the talents, verses 14 through 30. Kind of a brief overview of verses 1 through 13, he gives the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. And the reason why they were called wise and foolish are, are set forth in the fact that when the bridegroom comes back, when the husband comes back, and this details the whole um, concept of Jewish weddings, <coughs> some of the, uh, the foolish ones were not prepared and the others were. <coughs> they had plenty of oil for their lamps. And therefore, they were prepared when the Lord returned. Verse 11, 12, and 13. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, open the door. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And he's basically saying, be prepared all the time. If you're living the Christian life, you're always prepared. There, there is a lot today about uh, when is Jesus coming. And a lot of television and radio programs are focused upon end time events. And the Bible says this concerning that. Always be ready and you'll be ready when He comes. It doesn't matter when He comes. He's going to come back like a thief in the night. And that means unexpectedly. Watch therefore, for you do not know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So it's ridiculous to try to say that this is the generation or this is the time or some even go so far as to say this is the year, this is the day that it's going to happen. A lot of people are making a big deal about the year 2012. In fact, there's a movie made about it's going to be coming out pretty soon about the year 2012. It's the end of the Mayan calendar. Therefore, something... Jesus said ignore all that. Just live your life as you should, and you're ready whenever He comes, whether it's 2012 or 2312. We don't know. The point is, live faithfully. Don't be a, a, a setting dates. Don't be trying to calculate. Just live for the Lord. Be ready and prepared always, and therefore the Lord will receive you. Verses 14 through 30, it talks about how that while the Lord is away in heaven... We have responsibility on earth as His servants to be busy about His will. We'll go through and read the, the parable and then we'll go through and, and find lessons from it. Verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents and to another uh, one, each one according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one dug, uh, went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought back five other talents, saying, Lord... You delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you had delivered to me two talents. And look, I have gained more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of, the, of your Lord. Verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. 
So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and in my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he, who will, he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So let's go back and let's look at this. As he gives this parable of something that was very common in that day, as, as we know that parables were earthly stories that Jesus used to illustrate spiritual truths. He says here in verse 14, The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. Okay. In this parable, who is the man traveling to the far country, and what is the far country? The far country would be heaven. Christ would be the man traveling to a far country. So he's talking about him going to heaven, ascending to heaven after he completes his earthly mission. And he calls his servants and delivered his goods to them. Now his servants would be who? Us, the church, of course the apostles of the first century, um, the prophets of the first century, the preachers, the elders, the deacons, uh, Christians, the church as a whole. So those who would be his servants, and he delivered his goods to them. And notice what he says in verse 15. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. So he gave them talents. Now talent in the Bible here is referring to a measurement. According to Jerry Moffat in his uh, commentary, a silver talent is a measurement uh, that would equivalent, be equivalent in the U.S. money to about $1,500. In gold, one talent would be $250,000. So it's a measurement of a certain amount of money. And you can look at a conversion chart in a Bible dictionary or in a study Bible and you can see the breakdown of a talent and what it is compared with other monies that are uh, found um, in the scripture. It gives a breakdown to, to those things uh, in, usually, in most uh, study Bibles and dictionaries and encyclopedias. So what do you find there in verse 15? In the parable he's giving them talents or a measurement of a sum of money. What would that represent in the spiritual realm? Would it not represent abilities, responsibilities? In the first century, it would represent spiritual gifts. Uh, Today, it would not represent uh, to us spiritual gifts because we do not have those spiritual gifts, but we have abilities. We have natural abilities, talents, uh, as we would call them. That word talent has been brought over into English to represent what is your talent, In the ancient, it meant a measure of money. And and it's been brought over, probably because of this parable, to say he's talented at X, Y, or Z. He's a talented golfer. He's a talented painter. He's a talented, that means he has the ability to do something. So he's given his servants, his people, talents, abilities. We've been blessed with abilities to be active. Now, not everyone has the same type of ability, right? According to the verse 15, he gave one five talents to another two, to another one, each one according to his ability, and immediately he went on a journey. That's talking about Christ going back uh, to heaven. So each person has an ability, but not all people have the same uh, ability. Uh, there are those who can preach. There are those who can preach and lead singing. I can't lead singing. I get up there and try, but I'm not a song leader. 
but there are those who have the ability to preach, to lead singing. There are those who develop the ability to be an elder in the church. They meet the qualifications to be deacons in the church. And so there are abilities that we have um, given to us by God. Everything we have is given to us by God. The point is this, are we using it to God's glory? Are we using it to, to please Him? You know, one of the sad things, um, I watched the movie the other day, Valkyrie, about the attempt on Adolf Hitler's life. And, you know, thinking about Adolf Hitler and, and the things that were said about him, they said he had a tremendous ability to speak. And look at the talent that he wasted for hate. And that caused so much misery and so much bloodshed in our world. God gave him an ability to speak. What if history, what, how, how different history would have been if Hitler would have used his ability to preach the gospel? How different the world would have been. But we see here we all have abilities, each according to um, what we are able to do. And God asks us to do for Him with the ability we have. He does not require someone to, to do something that they're not able to do. Now look at verse 16. And when He had received the five talents, He went out and traded with them and made another five talents. So here's what you see in verse 16. What, what did this person with five talents do? What's the spiritual application here? He got busy. He got busy and he multiplied his talent. Doubled it. He got busy in doing the Lord's will. With what he had, he got busy with. How many times do people say, you know, if I just had X, Y, or Z, I would be very active in the church? If I just had X, Y, or Z, I would, I would, just, I would do more for the Lord. But you do have X, Y, or Z. You do have something. We all do. And yet, some of us don't use it. And that's what we're going to see in the man with one talent. So here's a man, he goes out and he doubles his effort. He gets busy in the Lord's work. Verse 17, and likewise, he who had received two gained two more. Notice, the one who had two was not not expected to get as many as the one who had five. But he, he took the abilities that he had been given to him by the master and used them. And that's the point. So we have that uh, uh, given to us uh, in this parable as a a great lesson. So we see the one that had five and the one had two, they got busy. And they became fruitful. You know, Jesus talked about bearing fruit. And if you want to hold your place here, and you look in John, John uh, chapter 15. He wants us to grow and to become better than we were when we were initially created. Redeemed when we were initially converted. He expects growth. He expects productivity. John chapter 15 and verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. He expects us to abound, to Bear more fruit. You bear fruit, you're going to have opportunities to bear more fruit, to grow. And so that is the point. He's given us responsibilities. He's given us abilities, each one according to what we can do. And He expects us to use those uh, abilities uh, in His service because one day the, the Master is going to return. Look at verse 18, back in our text, uh, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 18. But he who had one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Back in the ancient times, and sometimes even um, 
in our history in the United States, people, they didn't trust the bankers. And so they would hide the money. You've heard of the old timers who hide the money in the mattress? <laughs> it's hard to trust these bankers nowadays, right? But to, uh, to hide that money, to, to take something valuable and, and dig, dig a hole, hide it. Um, some people have done that with uh, their money or with valuables. Uh, they, they want to uh, keep it hidden. And here's a person who went out and he dug in the ground and he hid his Lord's money. Now, what, what is the, the application in the spiritual realm of verse 18? Greed or somebody who's just not active, not getting busy. I mean, just like the other ones, they got busy doing the Lord's work. So here's an individual who had a a talent, took the Lord's money, that talent, and hid it. He wasn't productive with that talent. The man with the five talents became very productive with his talents. So did the man with the two talents. But the man with the one talent, who had opportunity to use that one talent he had, didn't. He didn't. So we see in verse 19, it says, After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. What does that represent, verse 19? Judgment Day. After a long time. We're in that long time period right now. Judgment Day hasn't happened. So we're in that period of a long time where the Lord has gone away. He's in heaven. One day He's coming back to settle accounts. There's going to be a Judgment Day. And so just as He gave uh, the instructions in the parable of the uh, virgins the wise and the foolish virgin, virgins in verses 1 through 13 to be ready always because the Lord's returning. He's saying here, you not only be ready for that, but when I come back, I'm going to settle accounts. I'm going to settle accounts. So we see here the concept of being brought before the Lord and being brought into judgment for the things that God has given us as far as our abilities, our talents, our opportunities, and what we did with what we had. Not what we would do if we had, what we did with what we have. So we are in the long time period right now. The Lord hasn't returned. But the Lord, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. That's Judgment Day, verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Notice that. The Lord is commending this servant for being good and faithful. He was productive. That's good. He was faithful. And he was a servant. He served the Lord. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So what is the entering into the joy of of your Lord? What, What would that represent? Going into heaven. So this person who was active in the Lord's business, faithful over a few things, he would be made ruler over many things. Now, does that mean that in heaven there's going to be some sort of uh, a blessing in which we rule over many things? Don't know. Don't know. It's the point of you always reap more than you sow. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. You reap more than you sow. Therefore, here was a faithful individual, faithful over a few things. They're going to give, be given the glories of heaven. 
And you think about that when it comes to living the Christian life. Just faithful over a few things really does describe that. You know, if you live a faithful Christian life and you do great things here upon the earth, that's just a few things compared to eternity. And be made ruler over many things. You reap more than you sow. Uh, Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, if you sow to the Spirit, you'll love the Spirit, reap everlasting life. We always reap more than we sow. So what do we find here as far as his ability is concerned? He was judged according to his own ability. According to his ability, what he could do. Individual judgment, individual responsibility. See, I'm not going to be judged according to some other preacher or some other Christian. I'm going to be judged according to what I had, the ability I had, and what I did with those abilities. That's how I'm going to be judged. And therefore, that's what you find here. He had five talents. He was given that ability. He had multiplied his, his efforts, and therefore he was found to be a faithful servant to the Lord. Look at verse 22. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. And Jesus, or the Lord here, which represents Jesus, didn't say, well, how come you didn't get five more? How come you didn't get ten like the other? No, he was judged according to what he had. He had two talents. He multiplied his efforts. And he says in verse 23, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So we see here the people who are going to go to heaven are not only the people who are prepared, verses 1 through 13, but the people who are active in the Lord's work with whatever ability they have. Verses 14 through 30. Look at verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, here you have what is yours. What is verse 24 and verse 25? What does that show about this servant's attitude? He had very little faith. That's very good. And he's lazy and he also thought the Lord couldn't be pleased. But yet we see the Lord was pleased with these other two. The one who had the five talents, the one that had the two talents. So he had a misunderstanding that the Lord could be pleased. He said, I understand you were a hard man. Uh, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered. I was uh, afraid. Fear. Is that not the number one thing that keeps Christians from being active? Fear. Fear of messing up. Fear of, of, of stumbling. Fear of not saying the right thing. Fear of... Uh, of, of not being able to give an answer just like that, fear uh, of not being able to say the right thing in a heated moment, and so we just keep silent. Fear stifles us. And that's exactly what this man had. He, w- he was afraid. He didn't take the chance. He, di- he did not become active. Uh, he was afraid. And so we see here that fear can keep a servant from being what the servant ought to be. And notice, the servant was not rebuked for having just one talent because that's what the Lord gave him, one talent. He was going to be rebuked because he didn't do anything with that talent. I was afraid, verse 25, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, here is what you... Uh, have have what is yours in other words I did not use what you gave me what you expected me to use 
to serve you. Notice verse 26. But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Notice, notice what he says to that servant. You're wicked and you're lazy. Some translations say slothful. You're wicked and you're slothful servant. You know, when we think of wickedness, what do we usually think of when we think of wickedness? People being wicked. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Evil, but more specifically. That's good, though. More specifically than mean. I want specifics. Who is a wicked person? Give me an example of wickedness. People who would hurt others. Malicious activity. Rapist. Right? People who would harm children. How about terrorist? They're wicked, right? People who would, who would uh, take advantage of old, older folks. Wicked. And notice what Jesus said to a lazy Christian. You're wicked. You know, in the eyes of Christ, to be a lazy Christian is wickedness. That's what he said. You wicked and lazy servant. That's pretty severe. That puts a different perspective on things than the way we think. You know, we think, you know, a lazy Christian, oh, God's grace is going to cover them. God, God's going to let them into heaven. I mean, he's so full of grace and love and compassion. And sure, that's, that, sir, that, that Christian didn't serve the Lord, but he wasn't wicked. He wasn't out robbing banks and, and, and terrorizing people. He wasn't wicked. Yes, he was. According to the Bible, to be a lazy Christian, not active in the Lord's service, is wickedness. We need to see things the way God portrays them. Very good. There's no such thing as a small sin or, you know, like little white lies. I think that's why in, in the book of Revelation it says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire because humans, uh, lying, oh, it's just a little white lie. If they call, tell them I'm not here. If they, they tell their secretary, uh, if so-and-so calls, tell them I'm not in the office. Those little white lies. And people don't think, ah. But see, we're seeing things from a human perspective. We're not looking at things from God's perspective. And sin is sin. Now, some of them carry, or greater, carry greater consequences in this life than others. But all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. If that is the only sin a person committed, lying, they're going to go to hell and burn forever for it. And here we see here being lazy in the kingdom is considered wickedness by the Lord. Your lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, gathered where I have not scattered seed. Verse 27, you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. This is the least you ought to have done, is what he's saying. Here's the least you ought to have done, is taken that talent of money, uh, deposit it with the bankers, and I would receive back my own plus interest. That would have been the least you could, you could do. But he didn't even do that. Verse 28, Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. You take from that person, you give it to the person who was uh, acquired ten talents. Four, why? Verse 29, To everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who has not have, does not have, even what he has will be taken away. What's verse 29 saying? Basically, the whole principle is you reap more than you sow. To everyone who has, more will be given. You, you have faithfulness, you have uh, 
a, a person that is good. You have a, pay, a person who is active, abounding in the work of the Lord. He is going to be abundantly blessed. But he who does not have, you don't have faithfulness. You don't have uh, an attitude of humility. You're not active in the Lord's service. Even what he has will be taken away. And in verse 30, Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's verse 30 describing? Not going to heaven. The only alternative is hell. Eternal punishment. So that unprofitable servant is going to go to hell. Look, you see that in verse 30. Un, in front of profitable, means it's the opposite of profitable. The profitable servants are going to go to heaven. Not because they earned heaven, but because they were faithful with what God blessed them with. And they were servants of the Lord. They were faithful to the Lord. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. Faithfulness is expected of God's people. Nothing is earned by being faithful. It's all by the grace of God when it comes to what God does in our um, behalf as far as saving us. He's not obligated to save anyone. But He does so by His grace, mercy, and compassion. He expects His people to be faithful and to respond faithfully and actively uh, in service to Him. And so you see here that for a Christian, it is uh, important for us to be busy with whatever talent we might have, whatever ability we might have to be uh, faithful in the Lord's service because it's very easy to be lost. Just don't do anything. That's what he's basically saying. The unprofitable servant you cast in the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How long will the weeping and gnashing of teeth last? How long is that going to last? Eternal. Because the last verse of the chapter, after he talks about the judgment day again, in verses 31 through 46, he says, These will go away, verse 46, into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. The righteous, the profitable servant, the ones who are faithful to the Lord, the ones who used what God has given them to God's glory, they are the ones who are going into everlasting life. That's heaven. But the, those who did not use it, those who become unfaithful uh, and just, you know, basically they might attend a church service here or there, uh, they're going to be lost. And so we have to take seriously um, what the Lord is saying here concerning our service to Him. Here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to do it now because you probably don't have a pen and paper. But when you get home, I want you to think about the blessings, the abilities that God has given you and how they can be used for the Lord. And then ask the Lord, pray, ask Him to help you put into practice the abilities, the gifts. I'm not talking about spiritual gifts. I'm talking about natural gifts and abilities that we all have to the glory of God. All of us have something that we can use, that we can contribute to the Lord's service. It could be the ability to uh, speak in different languages, so to speak. Uh, for example, Zerata has helped me on several occasions in, in talking to someone who speaks Spanish. She has the ability to speak, you know, Spanish and English. So she uses that ability, that talent for the Lord and, and sitting down and having Bible studies with people, utilizing that in the Lord's service. And there, there might be things that, that, you know, none of us know about that you know that you can sit down and think, I could use this to the glory of God. You might be a good people person. You might be good with people one-on-one. -on -one. And also think about the opportunities that we have. Each person here has an opportunity to reach someone with the gospel more so than I do because of your personal contacts. You will be in contact with people that I'll never ever see. 
in school, in the workforce, neighbors, friends, relatives, you have those opportunities to spread the gospel and to influence others, to help those who are hurting, to help those who are in need. And those are opportunities that I will not have because uh, I don't have those same contacts that you do. Whatever we have, whatever blessings we have, we should use it to the glory of God. And we see that 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as he talks about our function in the body. The eye cannot say uh, to the ear, you're not part of the body. Because if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the seeing be? Every part of our body is vital and works together as a whole. And so we should work together using the talents and the abilities that we have because someday the Lord is going to come back from that long journey. He's going to come back from heaven and He is going to call us into account. He's going to, as verse 19 says, settle accounts with us. And so the question is, will we be found faithful? Any questions or comments about this? That's a very good point. He, he's not asking him, you know, to, to even double what he had. He's asking him to do something. You didn't do anything for me with what I gave you. And, and um, that's a good point. He rebuked him for just doing nothing. He could have done something. And that's the point. We all can do something. And if all of us do something, much more would get done. If each Christian said, I'm going to do something, we have opportunities this week. Invite people to come to this family Bible school. There's going to be opportunities for, for people to hear the gospel. There's going to be opportunities for people to be lifted up and edified spiritually. Those are opportunities. We have material there available. Let's use those opportunities. When we, can, we can do something. Each person here can do something. And you'd be surprised what you can do. That's the thing. Sometimes we sell ourselves short. And we would be surprised uh, what we can do when we put out that effort, knowing that the Lord is with us and He will bless us in our efforts. Anything else? If not, let's give the, them in the back about five more minutes. And um, that will be plenty of time from, for them to get their lessons over with. So that'll be 15 after 11. We can go back and get the kids. Thank you very much.